in Galatians chapter 2, still talking about church discipline, and because of this morning, or this afternoon's uh, context, what we're doing j just a second ago was church discipline. It's not always harsh and brutal. Extending forgiveness is part of church discipline, and it makes me excited that our church is not just learning about this, but being brought to experience it in the best possible way. Good day. Um, the passage we're going to be looking at here today is uh, Paul writing to the churches in a region called Galatia. And this is probably the first, if not the second, New Testament book written. James and this book are the first ones written. Um, Paul and James are both writing to encourage uh, new Christians, the churches that have been around for maybe 30 years by this point, maybe less, 20 to 30 years. Um, he primarily in this book writes to explain to Gentile, that's non-Jewish Christians and Jewish ones, that it is not by following Jewish law that one is a Christian, it's by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith, not works, is a theme of this book. Now, church discipline holds leadership to a high standard. And, and Paul tells a very brief story about he, him and Barnabas and Peter having an issue. Um, yeah, and as a church leader, we have a good handful. Um, it's important that you know that leaders are not above reproach. I'm sorry, uh, above accountability. They should be above reproach. They should not be above accountability. I want to be clear on this. Um, anyway, so what is church discipline? It is a set of standards. I don't know why that's cut it off there. Hmm. Anyway, it's meant to encourage the church to be a standard of right living, of righteousness, Christ-likeness. Um, it's supposed to be in place to grow our church. Me as an individual Christian, us as a church. Uh, it's not just for individuals, it's for the group. Not just for the group, for individuals. Uh, church discipline is both formative and corrective. We want to preach and teach and encourage and fellowship and worship as a training regimen. We also want to pull out the weeds, let's say, or to at least expose them. We, we don't want for sin to run rampant. It, it can be devastating. We want to acknowledge it. We want to put it out. If necessary, handle it aggressively um, if necessary. But that's both sides of it. Um, but the teaching sets us up for right pruning. Uh, real quick, biblical leadership, that's what that says. Again, I'm not sure what's going on with our uh, projector here. But it's not a hierarchy of, like, authority, right? Now, truly, church leadership does have authority. It should, anyway. Um, there have been a handful of times where Pastor Chris will say something that I'm like, well, you're the pastor, you get to call that shot. In our church life, in my life, that just happens, even if I'm not an, an uber fan of it. Church authority exists, but it's not, you're better than me. It's not an issue of status. It's an issue of responsibility. The higher up, up you go in church leadership, I mean, oftentimes we use the, the phrase servant leadership. And that phrase is, in, in, in a worldly way, an oxymoron. Servants and leaders are not the same thing. In a biblical sense, it is the exact same thing. We are responsible. The higher up you go, the more responsible you are. And that doesn't mean like you do more stuff. What it means is your sphere of influence is bigger and it carries more weight. You're a teacher. You work in the nursery. You work in BBS. You think about it. We're handing you our kids, the, our, our most precious treasure, and we say, hey, watch my kids for a while. It's more than just babysitting. It's I'm allowing you to have influence over my child. Now, for those of you who watch my kids, you, you know I take that extremely seriously, probably too seriously. But you know, I, I, I don't want for mine to be influenced by just anybody. When I have done youth ministry, when I do ministry here, when I am at my job, when we go to Standing Stones, I take that extremely seriously because somebody is telling me that I now have the privilege of having influence on their child's life or on your life. And, I, and that's not a light thing. In James 3, 1, it says, not many of you should be teachers because you're held to a higher standard. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And that's not, don't be a teacher, it's don't get into being a teacher or a leader too willy-nilly. It's not just, I'm in a cushy job. It's you are very, very responsible, and you'll stand in, in judgment to a much higher uh, standard. Um, back in our 
Revelation stuff, I, you know, I thought that was a good series. I want to keep referencing it. Ephesus did a good job here. True, they did it a little bit too much in some areas. They forgot their first love, but they were good at holding leaders accountable. They were hyper vigilant. They tested anybody who claimed to be a teacher, a prophet, an apostle, and if they weren't, they dealt with them immediately. They were like a heightened immune system. They, they would not let just anybody in. So they were good on that regard. Thyatira let anybody in, especially what, what, uh, what Jesus calls the Jezebel, a false teacher who leads the church in some pretty dark stuff. They let them in. They said, hey, you know what? I'm not here to judge. We love everybody. Teach whatever it is you want. That's not good. The church in Philadelphia uh, was a healthy church. They were steadfast. They were called pillars. Um, obviously, they held their leadership to a much high, uh, very high standard, and it paid off. They had quality leaders and teachers and servants, which led to a quality church. Um, there's a phrase here, and I'm sorry, it's not, I don't know, but they're called Judaizers. Paul references them occasionally. They're also referenced in the book of Acts. They're also called the circumcision party. Now, this is not like a party party, like, yay, party. It's more like, like the Republican Party. It's a group of people who agree to the same ideas. Judaizers are Christians who are Jewish, who want to bring the Jewish law with them into Christianity. Christians must obey the Jewish law and Christ, Jesus and. Now, for a while this didn't really matter because every Christian up until about Acts 10 is Jewish. It didn't matter. Once you start seeing non-Jews, Gentiles, becoming Christian, these, Judea these, these Judaizers would say, you Gentile must first become Jewish, especially circumcision, the men, then you can be a Christian. Only Jews can be Christians. Paul quickly starts to deal with this. In fact, it seems to me, I could be wrong here, he, in some ways, Peter, are the first two to, to recognize the danger and jump on it. Paul says some pretty weird stuff about them, and he doesn't like them. Uh, Paul will say things like, um, I think it's in Galatians, I think, where he says, uh, I, wish, I wish that they would emasculate themselves. Now, in Judaism, to be a, 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 a male member of the covenant, you had to circumcise the foreskin of your penis when you were eight days old. If you converted to Judaism, ruh -roh, if you converted to Judaism, you had to, at whatever age you were, be circumcised. To emasculate yourselves means to cut off your penis and testicles. So he's saying, if you care that much about uh, circumcision, go all the way. He's saying that like an insult. Um, I'll keep on talking to see if we can make this work. Uh, at this early stage in Christianity, there are not very many churches. Almost all the churches are in what is now Israel. You have the church in um, Jerusalem, which is where the apostles live. It's where they work. It's their home church. They're, they're doing their thing. Uh, and the church is just now, in Acts 7 and 8 and 9, just starting to branch out. Some are going to where Jesus lived in Galilee. Some are going into the neighboring nation of what is called Syria. Paul and Barnabas start a church in Antioch. I've talked about this before. This is a church of mostly Jews who are Greek speakers. So they're not from Hebrew-speaking Israel. And they don't have to deal with the, Ju the Judaizers much at first because the Judaizers are stationed in Jerusalem. Now, if you look in Galatians 2, we'll have to paint mental pictures here and totally get this thing working again. Uh, Galatians chapter 2. Paul tells a story of how he and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, and they went up to tell the apostles what was happening in their ministry. Now, here's why they did this. The apostles were sort of like living scripture at this point. There, until this book was written, there was no written down New Testament. The apostles were teachers. If you wanted to hear the teaching of Jesus, you had to go hear it from, there we go, from the apostles. And as they sent out ministers, in Acts you see Philip and Stephen, and then Paul and Barnabas, 
they have to regularly check on them to make sure what they're teaching is okay. Paul says, we went there. And I'm, let's see if you keep, keep going. Uh, are there any uh, questions on this, the, the Judaizer thing? Because they will play a big part in today's message. Again, they're Jewish Christians who teach that you have to be obedient to Christ and obey the law of Moses together to be a Christian. Yes, if they were Christians also. If, if, if they said, you have to be an Orthodox Jewish person to be a Christian. Which is why, this, and by the way, this book is all about faith. It's not works, it's faith, 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 faith. And nothing else, faith. And, and he really hammers that home. He, he has to. Because this, as we'll see, is a false teaching. One of the first heresies of Christianity. Okay, quick story. <laughs> The first name says Bishop Ambrose. Ambrose lived in uh, Milan, uh, in Italy, and he was a very powerful speaker and theologian in the 300s, the mid, mid to late 300s AD. So the Roman emperor at this time, Theodosius, uh, was a Christian. I, I would say not a strong one, but this is around the time the Roman Empire was Christianizing. Christianity had evangelized to leadership all the way to the emperor, and now Christianity is becoming the empire religion. Now, Theodosius is still the emperor. He has a military under his uh, authority, and he has to maintain order in the empire. Now, whoop. It's all right. Okay, whoop. Just. Every time I click, you're going to have to do that. I don't know. <laughs> all right. So anyway, there's a point where in, I think it's uh, Thessalonica, yeah, uh, a bunch of people revolt and kill some Roman soldiers. As an emperor, he can't allow that to stand, so he sends his army in and wipes out several thousand people. That's a kind of genocide. Ambrose hears about this. When the emperor comes, he's, he's traveling around, and he comes to Milan to take the Lord's Supper at church. He's a Christian. Ambrose meets him at the door and says, I'm not letting you in here. You cannot, you cannot be here until you show genuine repentance for what you've done. And he's like physically standing in between this guy and the door. Now, understand, Ambrose is just a church leader. Now, he's well known, but he has no authority in the state. He is staring at the emperor of the biggest empire at that time on earth. And he says, you cannot come in my church until you get on your knees and repent. Now, one of two things was going to happen. One, he would actually do that. Or two, Ambrose was going to be killed. No one speaks to emperors like that. And, and he's just speaking as if he's the boss. Ambrose, a bishop from a moderately sized city in Italy, says, you must repent, emperor of the known world, or I'm not letting you in here. I imagine it was very tense. Thankfully, Theodosius gets down on his knees, and Ambrose leads him there for like half a day. He's like, you have to really show me that you're repenting here. He, he speaks, and the emperor drops to his knees. Then Ambrose, he walks back inside, he shuts the door, and says, I'll let you know when it's, it's enough. Now this, I like uh, church history. I, I, I get into it in, in, in graduate school. It's full of stories like this, where the church has to stare down leaders who have sinned. Leadership that does not excuse you from accountability. Power, status, fame, face, does not excuse you. you you're, you're not exempt. He knew that if I let the emperor through, then why hold anybody accountable? It wouldn't matter. Now granted, not many have caused genocide, but it says you, you must repent. What you did was wrong. Not just embarrassing, but wrong. You, a Christian who is a leader, you're behaving this way, if I don't jack you up hard right now, it's open season on sin. It, it, it won't matter now. Now, imagine you're like the emperor's assistant or soldiers around the emperor. And this guy, who's not armed, who's just some guy, says, get on your knees and repent. I'm sort of like, okay, that doesn't happen. You get to draw your sword, and the emperor says, stop, and does it. No one sees an emperor do this. Emperors don't do this. They speak, and their word is law. This church leader just... I mean, it's one of those things where you spoke truth to power and truth won the day. It doesn't always happen, but it should be done. 
I say this to, to, to make some points about our thing uh, here today. And again, everything that we do in church discipline is about agape love, restoration, reconciliation. That's the point. R repentance makes that happen. Sin breaks it, violates it, shakes it up. Repentance begins the, the process of repairing. Okay, so here's the deal. You have the church in J Jerusalem. And all the apostles are there, but the leadership that Paul mentions are Peter, James, and John. Peter and James are apostles. This James is not James the apostle. By this time, the apostle James has been beheaded by Herod. So this is James, the author of the book of James. James, the, the half-brother, I guess, brother of Jesus. He's a leader in the church, but he's not the leader, right? That's the, the apostles are the leaders. But he's influential, right? So good for him. Now, context here. This church is the one primarily dealing with Judaizers. Jewish first. We, you know, it'd be like saying, if you want to be a Christian, you have to be Mongol first, right? It, it's, it's, all, it's all ethnically based, legally based. This is where we get the idea of legalism. You're depending on the law to save you. Now, Peter has seen some things. God pulled Peter out of that area and had him go and meet a man named Cornelius. It's in Acts 10 and 11, if you can't see it. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He's kind of like a, a captain. He's a mid-level authority in the Roman army. On the one hand, God sends Cornelius a vision saying, go find this guy named Peter and bring him to your house. He will tell you good news. All right? And he goes, does it? Same time, Peter is at his friend's house, and he's in prayer, and God shows him a vision. If you've read the story, it's a sheet with all these animals on it. Some are clean and some are unclean. In the Jewish law, Jews had to only eat those classified as clean. If it was unclean, shellfish, um, pork, you couldn't eat it. It was dirty, and you couldn't even like handle it. God says, eat. And Peter says, I can't eat because I've never broken the law. I, I've never broken that law anyway. And God says, do not call what I call clean, unclean. He does that three times. As far as I know, the only times where God says the same vision more than once. Peter is told three times, if I call something clean, it's not unclean anymore. That is confusing. But when the vision stops, these guys who are sent from the centurion say, this guy will see you, Peter goes. Now, long story short, Peter preaches the gospel, he sees the Holy Spirit fall on these Gentiles. The first time a full-on Gentile is a Christian. And Peter says, I've never seen this before. The Holy Spirit has fallen on Gentiles and not Jews. Now I know God has no partiality. He doesn't pick favorites. And the vision snaps in his brain. Ah, it's not just food. The Gentiles were a dirty people. Now God in Christ is calling them clean. They're now welcome in the church. In Acts 11, he goes back to his home church and says, guess what happened? I saw this. Gentiles are coming to faith without the law. And that's when the Judaizers and the church come into conflict. Peter, really the head apostle, says, hey, the Gentiles are good as long as they have the Holy Spirit. And the Judaizers say, but what about the law? Why would God send the law if we weren't supposed to obey it? So now we're in conflict. So far, are there any thoughts or questions? Peter knows Gentiles can be saved just like the Jews are. And anybody who's filled with the Holy Spirit, Jew or Gentile, they are brother or sister, Christians fully. Not cousins, brothers. Okay? So Peter knows better. Keep that in mind. God revealed him in a vision. This is how it is. Okay. Antioch. Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas is the head uh, pastor and Paul is just the teacher. And they have a church. It's primarily Greek-speaking Hebrews. Paul has gone out on his mission trip, um, his first missionary uh, journey, and he sees Gentiles becoming uh, Christians. He comes home, everything is going great. Now, as I was, I was saying before, Barnabas and Paul go to the apostles to say, is their ministry good? Is it good that we have a ministry to Greek-speaking Hebrews? Is it a good ministry that we are preaching the gospel to Gentiles? And the apostles say, you know, great job. And he particularly names Peter, John, and James. 
They said, we're great. They extend the hand of fellowship, he says. The apostle said, check, you're good. Keep doing it. So Peter knows better, and Peter has already said what they're doing is good. Yes? All right. Any thoughts or questions so far? Okay. Now, a little while later, Peter goes down to fellowship at Antioch. He comes to, to visit them, and they have meals together. That's a good thing. That, that's agape. Everything's wonderful. They're sharing food. He's around them. He might be teaching some. Who knows? But they're having a good old time. And Peter's there, and he's affirming everything. He's hanging out with Jews and Gentiles. He's not showing favoritism. He, he knows that God is impartial, so he must be. Everything is great. My, my opinion, my, my thoughts is, he's probably happy that the Judaizers are not there. One less thing to him to worry about. It would, I, I imagine, make him happy that he's seeing Jews and Gentiles fellowshipping together in Christ. He saw it happen with the centurions. He saw it in the vision. He's seeing all this confirmation. Hooray and hallelujah. Then, some guys show up from James. They come to hang out just to see what's going on. Now, these guys have an immediate effect on this church. And, and, they're, and they're not named, but they have an immediate effect on Peter the Jews at Antioch and Barnabas. I mean, it's like as soon as they get there, something shifts. And there's one of two reasons why. I'm not sure which is which. Number one, they're not Judaizers. But if they go back and tell the church in Jerusalem what Peter was doing, eating with Gentiles, then it will cause him a lot of headache. That, that could be it. That's quite possible. That he's just like, oh crap, here's these guys. I have to put on a good face. Or, they're Judaizers, and Peter is like, oh crap, it's the Judaizers. I'm a Jewish guy. I'm, I'm sitting here with Gentiles. Oh no. Somehow, they have influenced the Jews of Antioch. Barnabas, Peter, and the only Jew they don't seem to be or to impress is Paul. He doesn't seem to like well, what they're doing. We'll get to that in just a second. I, I like this option better. That's more my preference. Setting all this up. I'm setting the stage for conflict. Are we good so far? A leader is visiting. Some other guys come, and the leader changes. It's like a black and white difference now. There is now a divisive split in the church. Peter, Barnabas, your head pastor, and the Jews of your church separate, physically move away from Gentiles, and say, you're Gentiles, you stay over there. That's a problem. The leader, is the, uh, Peter, is the one who's initiating that move. The guys from James, the Judaizers, they are, they're there. They might have said something, but Peter is the one who goes first. He backs away and then other Jews follow him. Bear that in mind. He is a leader. He has a, a bigger, more powerful sphere of influence. And when a Jewish leader backs away from Gentiles, the instinct of Jews is to also back away. Barnabas backs away. All the Jews at Antioch back away, except for Paul. Now, he's not picking sides. He's more confused of what's happening, what's going on. So when they have their church meals together, their agape meals, the Jews are on this side and the Gentiles are on the other. Peter withdraws. Others withdraw. Agape has been broken in a big way. So, again, he withdrew from fellowship, and he would not eat with Gentiles because they're dirty. They're bad people. Now, this is not you murdered a guy. This is not you physically spit on somebody. This is not you started a fist fight. This is not, you know, racial epithets. This, this is not, I don't know, Straight up hate. This, this on the surface does not seem like a huge deal. So he doesn't want to eat with them. So what? Remember our, our context. Peter has had visions that the Gentiles are just as clean in Christ as Jews are. He has seen Gentiles come to Christ and not become Jewish. He has had to, in Jerusalem, answer Judaizers and say, you guys are not right. And yet still, when they show up at Antioch, he falls into this, well, I, 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 I'm around other Jews. I can't be with Gentiles. I can't be with them. 
For Jewish people, even Samaritans, half-Jews, were dirty people. If Jews had to travel in Samaritan or Gentile lands, when they got back to Israel, before they set foot on Jewish soil, they shook the dust off their clothes because they didn't want Gentile dirt in their dirt. And Peter treats the Gentiles of Antioch, his fellow Christians, like dirty people. The leader is doing this. So again, on one hand, Peter is afraid. He is fearing his reputation among false teachers. He is more worried about what he looks like to these other guys from his home church than he does to, I guess, Jesus. <laughs> right? He fears men more than he does God. He looks at reputation versus truth. And he physically moves away in, in regards to that. Now, why would Paul say, and he won't eat with us? Because in Acts 2 and in Acts 4, one of the defining features of healthy church is they ate together. They broke bread together. They, they regularly met in homes or fellowship places to eat together. Eating is a big point of relationship. Business deals go smoother when it's like, let's go have lunch. Or, you know, talk about, um, you know, when, when you want to get to know a young lady, you ask her to a meal. Right? It's not a questionnaire, not a lie, a, a lie uh, detector. You say, let's go have food. I'll, I'll even pay for it. And guys, you should pay. But the idea is, if we eat, it's more intimate. And Peter has broken that. The, the Greek word that is used in Acts is uh, koinonia. It's an intimate relationship fostered by life together. And Peter is breaking that in a church that he's visiting. I mean, it's not just his church. It's a church he's visiting, and he's now causing conflict. He is, 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 is uh, standing with false teachers and not true. He didn't eat with them. Again, he's falling back into old ways that he's been saved out of as a Christian. He knows. He's experienced. In Christ, I'm no longer bound by the law. I'm no longer bound by Jewish custom. There's something new in, in Christ. He's been preaching that in his own church. And these guys somehow just, they cause him to stop and go back. He withdrew. He's not eating with them because they're dirty people. Now, th um, I was once at um, a friend of mine's birthday party, uh, Jamie Tao, and she, her, her mom made all this food. And she was at Northwestern, so all these white folks are there too, and the food is all laid out. And this one girl, she goes, oh, oh, the, the, um, she goes, I love ethnic food, which I don't know what that means. But she leans over and goes, oh, that smells like vomit. The room changed. The, the room shifted. Now, Jamie's mother speaks very little English, but oh, that smells like vomit. Translated immediately. And things were said in mom about that girl that she didn't understand. Others understood. It was an immediate revulsion. Well, what do you mean you're not going to eat my food? It smells like vomit. Who do you think you are? I mean, or we were at uh, the Hmong New Year one year when we used to do Sonic Night. And a, a group came to help us one year from Wisconsin. And it was time to eat. And they're like, yeah, I don't really like this food. And they went across the street to Subway. And the mood of the whole group changed because this group that went elsewhere, it was like they were too good to eat with us. They didn't like this ethnic food, whatever they called it. And that was a big game changer. It, all of a sudden, the, the health of the group, the ability to function, was diminished. Eating is special. And instead of eating with, Paul says, you're, you're all dirty. Now, he never outright says, you're dirty people. But he's like, I can't sit with you, and walks away from them. Something has changed. When, when a leader of Christianity refuses to fellowship with you, what might your thought be? Like, imagine we're at a fellowship on Friday nights and pastor is sitting there and you sit next to him and he says, oh, and he just gets up and leaves. What would you think that means? Hmm? He's above it. He's better than you. What else? Hmm? He hates, well, at least you, because there wasn't it to you. That he hates you. That, that you're gross. There's something wrong with you. What? Well, well, maybe. If he sits back down with you. If he sits back down where he was, yeah. And P 
Peter did, does this. And this is, again, this is after he's preached at Pentecost. This is after he's had the Holy Spirit. He's, he's a church leader. He's well known in all the churches. And all of a sudden he's like, oh, I can't sit with you. He walks away. That simple action has deep, hurtful meaning. Personally, interpersonally, inter, uh, but also biblically, Christianly, churchly. Now there's a division in the church, those who are good and those who are not. He didn't have to say anything, he just acted and everyone knew. I'm sure that a lot of people were hurt by this. And, I, and, and Barnabas goes with him. The guys from James go with him, the Jews go with him, and they, they, they might feel awkward about it, but they still follow him. If we assume the goodwill on Barnabas' part, he didn't like what he did, but he did it. He followed a crowd rather than standing firm. Paul watches this unravel, and now he's upset. He sees what Peter is doing, his conduct, puts that a, a, alongside what he has been teaching, the gospel, and he sees they're not in parallel anymore. Now they're contradicting. He teaches one thing and does another. What do we call that? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. The opposite of hypocrisy is integrity. Integrity, hypocrisy. So far, Peter has been a man of integrity. Since uh, Pentecost, he's been doing the right thing. And now, at Antioch, and it's much worse because he's Peter. If he's Joe Schmo, new Christian, sits in the pews once every six weeks, it doesn't matter what he's doing. It's Peter. A leader. Maybe even the leader. Somebody who has great influence, great responsibility, and he is using it, and it's in a wrong way, and it's having bad effects. So there's a problem, what you're doing, and there's a danger. You're now splitting my church. Again, this is not his church. He's a guest. He's a visitor. Your behavior is dangerous, and the effects are the problem. You're here, and my church is splitting. I mean, right in front of his eyes, it's like a middle school prom. Other side of the room. It, yes? Well, if it was over time, it wasn't a long time. I mean, Peter wouldn't have been there for more than a week, maybe. I mean, so maybe it was a gradual thing, but it was still quick. It was maybe a couple of days, and his church is split in half. If it happened in one meal, that would be more shocking. And people are just like, oh gosh, he got up and moved. I mean, that's, that would have been more uncomfortable. But if it's that subtle change, that might have been even worse, because it's like a slow... Yeah, I know I sat with you yesterday, but I can't today because, you know, Peter's over there. And I'm Jewish and you're not, so anyway, you just give it a go. If it, either way, it's going to be hurtful. But it, again, if it was over time, it would not have been like months and months. It would have been a week or so at most. No else? Okay. So here's Paul. <laughs> Concerned that a major leader, that, that's what that says there. Concerned that a major leader in the church is behaving in a wrong way. Rut row. I mean, in many ways, Peter is an apostle with a capital A, one of the twelve. Paul often calls himself an apostle, but it's a lower A. He's a general apostle. He's just a messenger. Peter was with Christ. Paul never was. In many ways, Paul is outranked by Peter. Peter has much more authority, much more responsibility, much more sway. He's more well-known. I mean, he's, he's Peter. Now, Paul's a big deal, but Peter's a bigger deal. Paul knows this, but that's the problem. You're the biggest deal in the room, and you're the cause of the problem. You're not just some, you know, apathetic guy. Like, you're the main player. Like, you're, you're it. And you're behaving this way. So if there's something wrong here... And it's having an immediate consequence in my church. Paul's concern is the agape of his church. And somebody who's a higher, bigger name, more status, household name guy is the cause. That's a real messed up situation. Peter should know better. He's experienced visions. He's seen Gentiles becoming uh, Believers, and he even said, now I know God does not see favorites here. It's Jews and Gentiles. God shows no partiality. 
and Peter is being partial. Here's a fun fact for you. If you ever go and look up the Greek word for partiality, God is impartial, it's the word for face. God doesn't look at the face. It's a word for what? Face. Um, God doesn't look at the face. He doesn't look at surface level. The whole, he looks at the heart thing. Um, Peter is looking at the face, or in a manner of speaking, he's looking at the foreskin. I mean, he's looking at, you know, someone here is not circumcised and I can't eat with them. He's looking at surface level stuff, and, and that's the problem. It's the big problem. So, here's what happens. We have this situation here, the Jews and Gentiles. There's an ethnic split. There's a, I guess, a righteousness sin split. There's a church leadership split. I mean, between Paul and Barnabas, it's their church and their split on this issue because of a higher up leader. And Barnabas, I mean, and I'm guessing here, maybe he's going with Peter because he's the higher authority. I don't know. Either way, he's following Peter. Leadership split, church split, racial split, wickedness and truth split. At no point is this a split, a split about Christ. He's not even on the radar right now. It's, well, you're Jews, you're Gentiles, you can't compete with each other. Now, here's what happens. Paul calls Peter out in front of everybody. And he doesn't do the whole, like, let's go one-on-one -on -one thing, let's bring two. He just deals with it. He jumps right to, I'm bringing you out in front of the church. This is a public sin. It's having immediate consequences, and you should know better, and you're a leader, the leader. We, we don't have time for all this one-at-a-time thing. Public sin is going to be dealt with publicly, qu quickly, and harshly. Now, he says, uh, if you, though a Jew, who live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, when Paul writes this, I think he's paraphrasing. He must be, because this is not the point of his book. It's not a brag about how he took down Peter. Here's what he's saying. <laughs> In Christ, you no longer live like a Jew. You, you, you eat unclean things. You don't obey the sacrificial law because Christ is a like, you are not living like a Jew every day. You don't follow the law, Peter. And yet, God has shown you, and you've been teaching others to, to follow your example. Good. The law does not save. Being Jewish does not save. Circumcision does not save. If you, a Jew, live like a Gentile, you don't follow the law. In Jerusalem, in Antioch, I mean, just last week, you're eating with Gentiles as if nothing went down. And yet, why are you now forcing these guys to live like Jews? Implying that to be Christian, you must first be Jewish. If these Christians see you, which they have, and if they follow you, which they are, you are leading them back into sin, back into slavery of sin, the Jewish law, this idea of racial superiority, with a simple move of not eating with this group, you are causing a church to sin. He calls him a hypocrite. He calls him a false shepherd. Now, you're an apostle. And somebody says, you're a false shepherd. You're, you're fake. What could have happened here? All right, a fist fight. Sure, it's like, what did you say? Bam. And then you have these two guys who are brawling, Paul and Peter, throwing fists. All right? Why? Because that's, that's, not, that's not what you say to Peter. You honor him and you pray for him and you welcome him in, into your church. Not call him out for everybody. That's embarrassing. Who, who are you speaking to right now, Paul? That is Peter. You're bad. Now, Peter could have said, who do you think you're talking to, sir? I am Peter, the apostle, not just some minister guy. I'm an apostle. For three and a half years, I, I was with Jesus Christ. Where were you? Killing Christians. So, you, you know, he, he could have been putting him in his place. Because in that mindset is, I'm authority, I'm power. A hierarchy of power. A hierarchy of importance. And I'll say this for Peter. He doesn't play that game. Now, Paul, what is he doing here? This is key. He doesn't say, listen, we all know that someone here is sinning. We all know that we all sin. He doesn't play that we game. What does we do? It, it's like, it's like a cloud. Now we're all responsible. 
we all have our sins and we're all sinners and God, he doesn't, he doesn't do that. That's nonsense. He's saying, Peter, now there aren't many named Peter, it's not a common name then, because it, it, it means rock. Peter, you, I mean, you've done one of those, right? You! <laughs> Which all the eyes will fall the finger. Then he says, here's what you've done. He calls out his sin by name. He's not saying like, hey man, you've done some stuff. Or you, you, you have sinned. He doesn't say that. He spells out what he did in front of everybody while they're eating. Peter, you hypocrite, you false shepherd, you. You are a Jew and you don't follow, follow the law. Why, why should they? You hypocrite, you false shepherd, you. That's one of those, if they had them, that like record scratch sound, that like, you know, because it would have silenced the room. And then, he does it in public. Again, he's not doing this like, let's go talk over here, let's talk in the back room, may have a word. Because the impact is on everybody right now, he has to deal with it for everybody right now. He has to shine some harsh light on this now, because if Peter goes home, there's no way to fix this entirely. He's going to have it out right now. Which will we follow, the law or Christ, Peter? Which is it? So now, the people who followed him over there get to see what Peter will do. Those who couldn't because they're Gentiles like this. What will happen here? Imagine the suspense. You! You hypocrite and false shepherd. I'm not, I know, I'm pointing you. I'm not, I'm not looking at you. I mean, imagine that. Imagine on a Friday night or in like, I don't know, a cafeteria at Standing Stone. You! You sinner. That, that, that would probably not be a, 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 a simple thing or a common thing. Now, Public sin must be publicly rebuked. Peter is not, at this moment, until he is called out, he is unrepentant. He might feel odd, but he's still acting. He's unrepentant. Paul needs to stop this now. This infection is starting, and if he doesn't stop it, it will spread. The Judaizers are already at work. They have come to Antioch and have affected Peter. This is dangerous. This false teaching has infected my head pastor, Barnabas, and one of the main leaders of our whole group. This is bad. Let's stop it. This is not a time for soft words. And Paul is not one for soft words. You! Now here's the good thing. Peter could have thrown fists, or who do you think you are? I am Peter. I, you know, you know, you were this and that and thing. Now he listens, that's what that one says. He listens. He seems to just take it. Then he doesn't leave. He could have been like, screw you guys, I'm going back to Jerusalem where nobody ever questions me. I am Peter. Mic drop. Leave. And he doesn't get defensive. Who do you think you are? I am Peter. Whatever his last name would be. <laughs> I don't know if they had that. I am Peter, period. Stop right there. Full stop. He doesn't use his power. That's a big one. Who do you think you are? And he's got an audience. When people have an audience, they want to say face. They don't want to look bad. They want to try to like show out a little bit so that they can deflect the, the, con the conflict and tension. I am Peter. You go sit back down with your filthy Gentile friends. He doesn't do that. He is humble. Humility is the seed of repentance. It's what causes a person to then feel shame and guilt for what they've done to admit in front of all, I've done wrong, please forgive me. That, the essence of that is humility, not pride, not power, not importance, not face, not authority, not name or position. This could have gone really bad for Paul. At the beginning of his ministry, this could have gone terribly bad. Oh, you're Paul? Yeah, I heard you, you did to Peter. I, I can't speak with you anymore. I mean, all Peter had to do is say, I declare him a false teacher, and the church would have been like, I guess that Paul's a false teacher then. But he takes it, he listens, he takes it to heart, and Paul here doesn't say what Peter actually ended up doing. We get to see that in Acts 15, which we'll go to in just a second here. Any questions on this point? Yes? Mm -hmm. 
No, not outright. We, we kind of have to assume these guys who came seem to have had some influence on them. There were Jewish guys preaching Jews only, and Peter, being a Jewish guy, was like, okay, I got some come to you guys. And there's always some reason. It feels good. It's easy. It's convenient. Others were doing it. I was told to do it. I was the only one who, who would have said no. There's a lot of reasons. Um, but whatever his reasons, not one of them excuses him. One, because th 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 there really is no excuse for sin. Two, it's Peter. You are responsible. You're a leader. You're a model. Others listen to you with no filter on. They watch you with no filter. They just imitate you because you're Peter. Why are you doing this? When you're doing this, you're leading them astray. False shepherd. Well, whatever his reasons, none of them were good. Oh, yeah. And... Yeah, I mean, I guess Paul and Barnabas were closer, but Barnabas is not the source. Peter's not going up the chain. He's starting at the top. I'm, I'm dealing with you first. If, if you repent, others will follow. But that, that, that might have been his motivation, right? Or, or the whole thing like the, the fastest way to, to, uh, to murder a snake is to chop its head off, right? Like you, you start at the most effective spot. You are the source of this. I'll stop you. Or... You will stop me. I mean, it's kind of an all-or-nothing move. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, in Acts 15, we see what is called the uh, Jerusalem Council. The Judaizers are now in, infecting Antioch. They're infecting um, other churches in the region. And we have to end this. So they have this big meeting. It's like the entire church that is in existence sends leadership down, and they bring their case before the apostles. They're the authority. And again, uh, Luke in Acts li lists off Peter, John, and James. And everybody has a say. Now, the, the names I highlight in white, Barnabas, Paul, James, and Peter, are the ones whose thoughts are recorded in the book of Acts. The Judaizers, they said their piece, but Luke doesn't write their thoughts down. He just says, here's how it is, and I'll, I'll summarize the end here for you. No, uh, no, hmm. Both Jewish and Gentile Christians receive the Holy Spirit. So the first thing is, Jews and Gentiles in Christ are equal. Jews are not superior, they're equal. That's the first thing. Number two, Gentiles do not have to follow the law to be Christians. They do not have to be circumcised. That's a big one. Um, Gentiles can just be Christians. Jews can just be Christians. You don't have to become Jewish first to be a Christian. It's Jesus alone, faith alone, not faith and the law, not faith and circumcision. It's just faith. So what Paul has been teaching, this the apostles again say, you're right. Then they say that the Judaizers are false. I mean, it's like, these guys are polluting your minds. That's not a nice word. Someone says you are, are toxic, you're a polluter, you're dirty, you are poisonous. I mean, in the irony, they're saying that the Judaizers are the ones who are dirty, not the Gentiles. They're the ones who have been turning everybody against the Gentiles and splitting churches. They are rebuked. We don't see much of them again after this. Paul and Barnabas are vindicated. They're shown to always have been right. Except for Barnabas and that one of those men, you know. But they're like, we've been teaching that Gentiles can be Christians too. Vindicated. Great. You're right. In Acts um, 15, then James writes a letter, uh, like a brief one, to all the churches, and he lists off five things Gentiles must do to follow, you know, godly in instruction. Um, and one of them is you don't have to be circumcised. The others don't matter at this moment. But he says, we're, we're not putting the burden of the law on you because you're free now in Christ. Now, in Jerusalem... Agape is restored because the Judaizers are checked and put back in their place, or they're asked to leave the church. Either way, their influence is ended. They no longer have the ability to teach what they're teaching. They've been rebuked, and they cannot talk anymore about that. It has been decided. You're wrong. Stop talking or leave. In Antioch, things are back to normal. Everybody's good to go now. 
The Jews and Gentiles can fellowship. The influence of the Judaizers is over. That's a good thing. And all of that because Paul stood on truth. Not on reputation, not on status, not on authority, not on leadership, not on, well, you were with Christ while he was on the earth and I wasn't. He stood on truth, period. And he felt c confident enough to speak harshly, directly, and publicly to one of the founding members of the church. Because he spoke, he showed not only what truth was all about, but that even leadership can be held accountable. Even leadership is within the bounds of being rebuked. However apostle you are, you're not about truth. You're, you're not about Christ. And if Christ showed, as he showed to Peter, that both Jews and Gentiles can't be saved, that's the final word, period. That no one else can argue that. And if you do, you show yourselves false. There is no leader who is above accountability. And when, if a leader tries to use his or her power to say, like, well, hey, I'm a deacon, I'm a men's ministry, I'm a nursery, I'm this, you can't talk to me that way. Already, they are wrong. That's an immediate evidence that they're automatically wrong because they're using your power as a shield. Being held accountable is never comfortable. Ever. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be. In most societies, most cultures, the idea of leadership means you're sort of untouchable. In the church, that cannot be. Whether it's a pastor, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, whether it's somebody who works in a nursery or VBS or whatever, just because a, a, a person served the church does not mean they're untouchable. It means that they should be even more heavily accounted so that you don't have an instance like this happening where people will take sides and split things and gossip and rumors and festering and everything will fall apart. To hold leadership accountable, you must stand on truth and even if you're not listened to, even if you get in trouble, you speak. One of the things I was preaching about uh, Bama is that he would say, even a little kid can hold me accountable. He said, if I do something in the church and a five-year-old says, but pastor, you did this and it's wrong, I can't ignore that. Even though I'm an adult, I'm the pastor, and they're a child, they still have that right. Now, honestly, a, a five-year-old issue of accountability might be pretty simple and limited, but that doesn't mean, I mean, still, the agape of the church must be protected, must be. Church unity must be protected. Sin allowed is like gang <clears throat> uh, gangrene. It just spreads and infection and things die. Sin dealt with, sin admitted, forgiven. Uh, people whose conduct and teaching are parallel, their integrity, healthy church, agape safe. We allow anything to threaten that, and the whole church suffers. Now, are there any thoughts or questions about what we said this afternoon? Of course, my son goes right to cook. Any last words? And we'll wrap up. In, in closing, you are in Galatians chapter 2. There's a verse that I always liked. Paul makes a, a, a reference here when he is talking to Peter and the, all the apostles. This is in verse 6. apostles to have his ministry tested, he says, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God showed no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, just as Peter had been in, entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter is uh, the same one who works through me, 
When James and Cephas and John, and Cephas is another word for Peter, seemed to be pillars, for see the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Influence and status and authority don't mean a thing. All it means is you're more responsible to serve. If a person uses their power as, as a status or protection or a shield, they're not real godly authorities, period. Now, you might have the last word, otherwise we're going to pray and be done. Let's pray. Father, I pray that our leaders would always be humble. I pray that we would worry about more our impact on others than the power of the status that we have. I pray that we would never put our faith in titles. I pray, Lord, that at no point would a person's status or leadership be a deflection or an obstacle to accountability and church discipline. I pray that we would all be humble before your word and before each other. Father, I pray that we would be strong in the God, that we would be a church known by that, that we would be an influence on our sister uh, churches to also be uh, churches of agape. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Is there a song here? I think Michael, no, no. All right. Have a blessed week. You are.